Hello, hello, it's the Japan Zumina. Uh, welcome everybody from UC San Diego. It is December 5th, 2023, which makes it December 6th, 2023 in Japan. Ohayou gozaimasu. Let me see whether I can forward. Yes, here we go. I'm Ulrika Shader. I work at this wonderful university and you are at the Japan Zumina. Um, we are here at the School of Global Policy and Strategy, GPS. And there's lots of information on this slide about our school. Uh, perhaps the most relevant to some of our audience is that we offer a large number of degree programs, including a Master of International Affairs with a Japan specialization. And um, uh, JFIT is our Japan Center, uh, where we hope to illuminate Japan's role in world commerce, innovation, politics, and societal issues. And uh, we're a fun bunch, and we have a lot of uh, interesting activities here. If you'd like to learn more about JFIT, please go to jfit.ucsd.edu. Our events are recorded, including today's. So uh, there, there are two important items associated with that. One is uh, feel free to type any questions into the Q&A box throughout the event. If I read out your question, I will refer to you only by your first name to protect your privacy. The good news is that because our events are recorded, we have a library called Jay-Z Gallery. You can find links to past events at jfit.ucsd.edu slash Zuminar. We have some upcoming events. Of course, today we're talking about trains and the Shinkansen, and then we'll go on a winter vacation um, and come back on January 9th, which is January 10th in Japan, with Robbie Feldman and Kenji Kushida to discuss entrepreneurship in Japan, a view from history, so the history of entrepreneurs. Uh, and then on the 23rd, we'll have Rick Katz here who will look into the future of entrepreneurship in Japan. Um, and we'll, we'll have other topics throughout the winter quarter. Uh, please check us out and make sure you follow us on the various social media. It's the end of the year, it's that time of year where I have to tell you that we are poor and dependent on everybody's support. On our website, it's actually fairly easy to support us. You can go to this little thing and then there are these gold buttons, give now. But let me uh, add a little bit here. So um, it's not just about the money, which is of course super important. And uh, if each of you were to give us $10, that would carry us through the winter quarter. But it is also the number of donations and the politics behind this, because including a GPS, there's still, I think, an ongoing love affair with other parts of Asia, uh, and not so much Japan. And the more I can show the powers that be, that we have a, a group that rocks here and does Japan, uh, the better and the, the better for the longevity of this program. So thank you for considering uh, sending the signal to our various uh, deans. And um, uh, uh, our very own Takaki Oizumi has um, uh, made a ferocious dragon, dragon here. So we're gonna look forward to a ferocious 2024. Please look out for our letters um, at the end of the, for the end of the year and the beginning of the new year, it'll look something like this. And with that, enough of me. Let me introduce the Shinkansen top star speaker. Here's Professor Jessamyn Abel. Hi, hey, Jess. How are you? Hello. <laughs> it's great to have you. So let me introduce you to, to the folks. Um, uh, so Professor Jessamyn Abel is an associate professor at the Department of Asian Studies at Penn State. She earned her various degrees um, in the following way, a BA in politics from Princeton, followed by an MIA from Columbia, wrong school, Jess, but that's okay. Uh, that's our top competitor, actually, the Masters of International Affairs at, at, uh, at Columbia so is uh, similar to our, our MIA, actually. And then she earned her PhD in history uh, at Columbia University, I believe, uh, as a student with uh, Carol Gluck. Prior to uh, the teaching at Penn State, she's been a visitor at the University of Tokyo, at MIT, and Bowling Green. Uh, she has three books to her name and many, many papers. And the latest one, of course, is the this one that we're going to talk about today, uh, The Dream Super Express. Uh, in 2015, she published a book uh, titled The International Minimum, Creativity and Contradiction in Japan's Global Engagement 
1933 to 64, which is about Japan's rhetoric of international cooperation. That sounds really interesting. And I think I want to put that on my reading list. And there's also a co-edited uh, book with Leo Coleman on infrastructures and global politics aesthetics, uh, too. I want to read that. Then there are many papers uh, to her name and, and reviews and so forth. And she has her own website. Um, and so if you type in Jasmine Abel, it'll pop up right away. So thank you, Jess, for, for joining us today. I'm super excited. And for full disclosure, uh, I'll, I'll tell the folks that I've actually read this book cover to cover because I reviewed it um, uh, for, a, for a journal. And I have to say, I was a little bit nervous about that review because I'm a business scholar. You're a historian, and so we get at things in different ways. But it was just such a delight to read this book. It is it is super well researched. There's a lot of very very careful, uh, you know, deep Japan knowledge in this book, and yet it's a fun read. So you squared the circle. So congratulations on a great book, and thank, thank you for you. me today. Wow, uh, thank you for for such a great introduction. Um, uh, I will say I was also a little nervous about that uh, book review before I read it. I thought, oh no, what, what is she going to think of my book? But uh, uh, so thank you for for inviting me, and and all of you that here uh, in the audience, thank you for zooming in to hear about the Dream Super Express. Uh, this refers, of course, to the new Tokaido line, which uh, opened for business on October 1st, 1964. And at the time, it was the world's fastest regularly scheduled passenger train. Uh, and so as the world's fastest, it really captured people's imaginations. And that's the real topic of the book. Rather than the bullet train itself, it's about the dreams and the, and the nightmares that, that it inspired. Um, and in that sense, being about how people thought, uh, it's also in some ways a history of Japan in the 1960s in terms of how the bullet train inspired people to rethink Japan's international standing, Japan's national economy, uh, the cities along the route, how they related to each other, the place of the individual in society, and even for some people, uh, personal identity. A core idea of the book comes from the anthropology of infrastructure, and a lot of people have written about this, um, but I think uh, Brian Larkin um, explains uh, a kind of generally used concept really well in an article he wrote on the politics and poetics of infrastructure. And Larkin explains in that article that infrastructures function in basically two different ways. On the one hand, they have a technical function, and that's the task that they were built to do, carrying people, carrying goods, uh, moving electricity, uh, moving information, what have you. So there's that technical function, but at the same time, they have an aesthetic function. Uh, and so infrastructures like roads and railways are not just these technical objects, but rather, he says, they are concrete expressions of the dreams and aspirations and fears of both individuals and societies. And so he's talking about aesthetics, not in terms of beauty, but really it's about people's emotional reactions, right? It's the feelings that a work of infrastructure inspires, both positive and negative. So thinking about infrastructure in these ways, uh, the technical function of the bullet train was actually fairly limited. People could go back and forth between Tokyo and Osaka, uh, the two biggest cities in Japan, um, much faster. Uh, and that contributed to a system-wide speed up of the entire Japan rail system, at the time, Japanese National Railways system, uh, because other express trains uh, changed their schedules so that they would meet up with the uh, the Super Express wh where you could transfer. Right? So the whole system speeded up a little bit. Um, and the bullet train itself did not carry freight, but by pulling passenger traffic away from the existing Tokaido line, it effectively increased freight capacity as well. So it did have these technical uh, function changes. Um, but the impact on the aesthetic function was in some ways um, 
deeper and certainly much broader insofar as it affected people well beyond those who were directly involved in the planning or the building or even using the new high-speed rail line. So my question for the book was, how did the aesthetic functions of the bullet train interact with major trends of post-war Japanese society? And what does this teach us about infrastructure? And what does this teach us about post-war Japan? So I decided to research the bullet train initially in part because I was perplexed. I had been working on that um, book you mentioned on international rhetoric, and I, I'd been studying the 1964 Olympics, which began uh, just over a week after the bullet train started running. So as I was doing that research, I kept seeing articles about this new high-speed rail line, and they were just sort of breathlessly excited about this new train. And I thought, well, it's, it's just a train. Why are people so excited? Um, and People, uh, people started to talk about it as sort of representative of Japan. And in fact, the bullet train has been called a symbol of Japan in various venues uh, here on the, uh, in the image here, um, fairly recently by JR Central promoting the bullet train to an international audience, uh, using a lot of the standard imagery that you see in promotions of Japan, the, uh, the cranes and the Big Red Sun, and of course, Mount Fuji, <laughs> ever present symbol of Japan, alongside this um, sort of very sleek, uh, modern looking train. Um, so it's not exciting to say that it's a symbol of Japan, uh, but why? <laughs> why is it such a symbol? And in the book, um, there, the, my argument is that the bullet train became such a powerful symbol because people were able to fill it with meanings that mattered to them. So the bullet train embodied the nation or community or the self in different ways for different people. Each chapter of the book considers one aspect of this. Uh, so thinking about the aesthetic function of the bullet train in connection with some important trend of the 1960s. Um, so thinking about different groups in terms of what they cared about. And the structure of the book is that it goes from a the most local uh, perspective and gets gradually wider, winds out to finally in the last chapter, a global view of the bullet train. Um, so beginning, the, the first chapter begins with political battles uh, at sort of the most local level, uh, one station. And so battles over Kyoto station. And these struggles over where to locate if indeed there is to be a Kyoto station, um, they show how the bullet train became part of the post-war struggle over the definition and practice of democracy. And it's it's a nice example because it's right there at the nexus between local and national, because it's a national project, but they really have to deal at every point along the route with local communities and concerns about urban planning or, or land planning in those local spaces. And it seems obvious in retrospect that the bullet train would stop in Kyoto. It's an important city. It's a major tourist de destination. But in fact, the first um, plans for the bullet train, which you can see in the dotted lines uh, here, actually passed by Kyoto. They wanted to make the straightest possible line between Nagoya and Osaka. Um, so you see they were thinking of going well south of Kyoto. Um, those lower two dotted lines, the single dotted lines, um, very early on were rejected because the quality of the land was uh, deemed insufficient for high-speed rail. And so they went with the upper double dotted line, which even that one, you can see if you look at the Kyoto area here, would pass well below, well south of Kyoto Station. So the realization uh, when this um, double dotted line was proposed as the route in November 1959, sparked a campaign by Kyoto leaders to have the Super Express stop there. And this became part of a much larger effort to rebrand Tokyo, uh, sorry, Kyoto as an international culture tourism city. Ultimately, they were successful, and that led to a second political struggle by communities and uh, groups who would be either displaced by bullet train construction or would be condemned to life under the shadow of this high-speed high speed rail tracks. Um, for instance, 
in places like Yakatocho here, um, where you can see uh, this um, housing is, is uh, right um, underneath the tracks. Uh, similarly here in Minami Ward, um, and perhaps most extensively in Hachijo, where um, shopping and residential districts had to be cleared out to expand the station southward. So that's the focus of chapter one. And then the next chapter zooms out a bit to the uh, Tokaido region. Um, and on that regional scale, the impact of the anticipation and early use of the bullet train uh, on space is the focus here. Um, so one example is new stations and platforms and tracks on the one hand, destroyed spaces. Uh, you can see in these two photos here, what was a road gets covered over with the tracks, but at the same time, uh, or at least a little bit later, they prompted new uses of those spaces. So this is uh, in the Yurakcho neighborhood of uh, Tokyo. You can see here on the left, the area under the tracks has been filled in with all of these little eatery and drinkeries and it's now a fun place to go and get a get an evening drink and, and snack. Um, in other places, the pull of the bullet train station when it was located outside of uh, the centers of cities actually created new city centers. And so Shin Yokohama station here is one example where the station was located in what had been agricultural land, but you can see um, by that right-hand picture is 2009, um, it really became a, a new city center there. Uh, the bullet train also impacted the ways that people understood the relationship between transportation infrastructures and space. And um, well, one example uh, of the ways in which I uh, address that in this chapter is through the movie uh, Gamera, the giant monster. And I really just put this poster up here <laughs> to um, make the point that one of the really fun things about writing this book was that there is a lot of popular cultural materials that feature the bullet train. And so I was able to do things like watch Gamera, the giant monster and, and call it work. So <laughs> I liked that aspect of this book. Uh, the next chapter, uh, again, um, pulls out to look at the national level uh, where the bullet train was part of what was being identified as the informationization uh, of the Japanese economy. And we can see this in claims of land planners um, within the government, uh, academics, um, but also in popular culture. And, and one example is the movie uh, well, it was released in English as Bullet Train um, in 1975. The Japanese title is, um, well, I wanted to translate it as Big Bash on the Bullet Train, but a colleague convinced me that sounded like a, a high-speed party. Um, so I just went with, you know, Big Explosion on the Shinkansen or something like that. Um, a, a movie that really focuses on those uh, high-tech communications, computerized communications aspects of not just the bullet train itself, um, but Japanese, the Japanese economy in general, and how that was creating a lot of economic dislocation and problems, social problems. The next chapter zooms out again beyond Japan to look at the East Asian region. And we can see here that the bullet train was also part of a 1960s rethinking of Japan's imperialist past because the announcement of the plan to build the train sparked a flood of reminiscences of two wartime railroad projects. One is the Asia Express, which opened in Manchuria in 1934. And you can see some uh, images of that here. And the other was the original bullet train, the Danganresha, um, that was a planned but never built line that was supposed to go from Tokyo to Shimonoseki. Uh, they started it in the late 1930s and had to cancel it in the 19, early 1940s due to a lack of uh, manpower and or person power and, um, and materials and other resources. Uh, but um, one tangible uh, progress that had been made on that was the beginning of digging for what would later become the new Tanna Tunnel. So that's a kind of a point of connection between that wartime project and, and the bullet train that actually got built. Then the last 
chapter uh, is uh, more of a global focus. Um, the bullet train uh, was featured in efforts to project a new national identity to the world through public diplomacy. And one of the main examples in that chapter is the 1964-65 New York World's Fair. Uh, planners of the Japan Pavilion for that fair explicitly stated that they wanted to eliminate what they called the Fujiyama Geisha image of Japan and replace it with a sense of respect and appreciation for Japanese technology. And you can see the bullet train um, played a part in that here, this is um, what's not usually a very visible part of the bullet train. It's the chassis on rails that were sent over from Japan, but it's uh, sitting in front of a pair of images that, sorry, this is the best image I could get of this, but it says transportation, 1960s, 1860s, and it contrasts a, a photograph of the bullet train with a um, printout, print of uh, a woodblock print of people carrying a palanquin, so trying, using the bullet train as sort of a, an example of the leap forward of Japanese technology. Um, <clears throat> the book ends with a quick look at some of the connections to contemporary Japan and, and echoes of each chapter that we can see in, in recent years uh, in Japan. And this is just one example. Um, this is a poster I happened to see uh, on a, a bullet train platform in June 1915, when I was in Kyoto doing that the research for that chapter, um, and I was very excited and wanted to get a picture without necessarily stepping off the platform and getting hit by the train that I was waiting for. So you get a little bit of a diagonal uh, picture here. But um, I, I thought it was interesting because you can really see Kyoto officials using that same old rhetoric of uh, combining the very futuristic looking train with those symbols of traditional Japan with the Tori gate, et cetera. Um, they were not as successful, of course, um, which is kind of a reminder of the, the contingency of history. Um, but I am gonna stop there and uh, because I, I really wanna just hear questions and, and I'm eager to hear what, what people have to say and ask. Well, thank you very much. Wow, um, I was actually thinking from how how would she do this? But you you met you met so it's um, it's it's a fascinating book, and um, you you cover it great. But for for me, the the last chapter was like the the exciting one with the the expo and no no we're not a country of geisha and Fujiyama and you know and, and but then at the same time in these even in your last poster there it is again. There's the fan, and there's the you know. So so um, so somehow the Shinkansen has become one of those symbols, and that makes it so very interesting. The the one thing you don't talk didn't talk about um, in 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 this overview was the vertical city and the architecture aspects of it, which I actually personally maybe because I did I knew the least about, or you know I didn't expect in this book. But I hadn't thought about the vertical city. Could, could you just add a little bit more? Because there was a whole there's a whole chapter on uh, Japanese architects uh, of the '60s, and and uh, you know the, some of the famous names were all involved in shaping the conceptualization of what a train station is. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, that uh, uh, was sort of a. a Something I, I also didn't expect. <laughs> There's a lot about this book that I kind of didn't didn't know what I was going to be finding. Uh, and um, a train, I think of as something being on the ground, uh, but it was being planned at the same time as people were starting to be very concerned about the population of Tokyo. It was getting already in 1960, uh, it was getting very crowded. I think the it was around 1960 that it hit a sort of a population milestone of 10 million residents in Tokyo. And so a lot of people were um, talking about uh, how to deal with that. How can we move people better in the city? Uh, how can we live more effectively with this many people in this crowded a space? And there were the bullet train played into a couple of different approaches to that question. Some people said, if we make it easier and more convenient to leave and go elsewhere, people will go elsewhere, right? But 
some response to that was no they'll just more people will come to tokyo because it'll be better even better to live here um but the other uh response to that was okay we have to build up right and so that's where we get into that point you were making about the layered city um and you could see a little bit of it a hint of it in the picture i showed of the restaurants tucked under the tracks in yurakucho um be in that's one example of the way that the bullet train got kind of pulled into what was becoming a much more popular idea uh, promoted by people like you mentioned the famous architect Tange Kenzo was was one of the big idea men behind this um, and uh, he and some some um, others, some sociologists and other uh, land urban planners said, OK, the way we can have to deal with this population growth is to um, build various levels at which we can live. And so the bullet train, of course, in one way, because it was too um, difficult to, to get a lot of land in the city. They did end up using elevated tracks throughout the city. That was also a, a much safer way to do it. Um, but also uh, the station itself, Tokyo Station, ended up being a, a good demonstration of how this should be done. So it was they were dealing with overcrowding in Tokyo Station and it, the, the station was kind of a mess. And so they said, we have to remake it. Let's move all these shops that are sort of creating a glut of people underground and then we'll put the um high speed rail line platforms above ground and so you would walk into the station and kind of go to different levels you could go to this underground city and do all your shopping uh get get something to eat i mean it's still you know you could get lost easily underneath tokyo station today right um and uh, and you'd go up to uh to get on the the trains out of town or um uh you know, I think the the Yamanote maybe as well. Um, yeah, so different levels for different activities. So that's interesting. Uh, just yesterday, I talked to uh, one of the people at JR East that was actually in charge of thinking about the train station as a shopping center, which, you know, is not normal, right? I mean, so European train stations aren't really shopping centers and certainly American train stations aren't. And so yeah. uh, our interview question was, well, how did you come up with the idea of building a shopping center at a train station? And he looked at us and said, duh, that, that, that's where the oh, people are. <laughs> he was like, Satani Mai, so where else, right? But, you know, this is where you are. And, and he was initially in charge of Ikiben and turning that business around, so it's a food. And then mm -hmm. you can actually easily expand that. And so um, so, so I thought that that also this whole um, aspect of of, of of Tange Kenzo and the architecture schools and so forth was quite quite something. So um, we we have uh, questions coming in from the audience, which I will try to weave into our conversation. And so one of the chapters that you know initially I had to chew on, but you know, complete disclosure, I kind of oh, I'm not sure I like this chapter. Was the one on Kyoto uh, because as a first of all, it was fascinating to to see how how they how the line was decided you know and then the the Tokyo the Kyoto politicians were all lobbying hard it has to come here and the Kokutetsu cannot just possibly bypass Kyoto but then when they laid the tracks there was also some dissatisfaction that the Kokutetsu didn't pay the people off that had to be relocated. And I was thinking, that's not fair. Right? First you say, come here, and then you get all angry at the company for you know, not paying off uh, you know, the people that they're relocating. Because the uh, Kokutetsu did not want to go to Kyoto. Right? They, right. They, they, that was too complicated. It, it defeated the purpose of going really fast because it, it creates this, you know, and so, um, so what was your takeaway from this Kyoto thing? I mean, you, you actually go to quite length about the displacement of people. Um, well, I, I think part of the that apparent contradiction is that there are just different groups of people with different interests. So the group of people who were lobbying so hard to get the station weren't really talking to their constituents, right? Uh, it's a question of um, 
I forget the phrase that I'm looking for, uh, priorities of scale or something like that, right? Like this is great for Kyoto as a city, but of course it's really bad for some very <laughs> specific communities within Kyoto. And so the problem was that the leadership of Kyoto was really thinking about the city as a whole, uh, or as some people were accusing them, maybe thinking about themselves. Um, but uh, that perspective of thinking of the city as a whole led them to push so hard for uh, the station that they weren't so much um, thinking about in that initial stage, what this is going to mean for the people who are going to be in the way of the tracks. And then that question arose much later when Jay, uh, well, Kokutetsu, uh, uh, came to explain to the local people what was going on. And they actually ended up doing that much earlier than they wanted to because the um, Kyoto City Assembly was pushing them so hard for specific information because as rumors started flying around, people were getting really nervous, uh, local communities, um, nervous about what this would mean for them. And so they kept bugging their representatives. Are we going to have to move or not? What's going on? And so JNR ended up sort of announcing the plan before they were completely ready. Um, so they initially said a much bigger swath of land might be affected than was actually going to be affected. And um, so uh, uh, people got very upset. And um, it's uh, part of the result of that was that um, the planning uh, was, was complicated by that sort of difference of pull, 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 and then, oh no, don't, right? And so some people at JNR got really angry at Kyoto, at the Kyoto leadership, because they said, what, you asked us to come, and now you're complaining that we're not doing enough, or you're refusing to pay for this up this uh, improvement of the station, and you want us to pay for it. And so people in JNR really felt like that there had been some kind of a bait and switch and um, felt resentful. Whereas the Kyoto leadership, uh, they were, they had gotten what they wanted and then they're sort of trying to help their constituents, but not in a really strong way because the, the crown jewel of this was a stop on the Super Express. And so even after JNR said, okay, the tracks are gonna go to Kyoto station, they initially said, but I think just the local bullet train, right? The one that stops at 10, 10 places, not the one that stops only at a few places. So the idea was that they were gonna go directly from Nagoya to Osaka and without stopping in between, the Super Express was. So the fastest train still wouldn't stop at Kyoto. So the Kyoto city administration couldn't push JNR too hard on the problems of its local people because JNR was still holding out this this one last thing they wanted of the stop on the Super Express. So they really were trying to pull a balance there. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, people really had to take matters into their own hands with sit-ins and other kinds of protests in order to get what they wanted. So it's a fascinating story uh, to read that because it also sheds a light on politics and poverty and and the self-interest of politicians and local politics and so forth. While we're on that topic, Jeffrey actually has a question about Kyoto Station, which looms slightly in the book, right? I learned a lot about Kyoto Station. So, uh, so Jeffrey's question is that um, uh, having spent a lot of time in Kyoto, I can't imagine the Shinkansen bypassing it. How, how would that be? But, but do you think that the futuristic style of the new Kyoto Station, um, which is one of the only modern structures in the city, of course, is due to the need to be as futuristic as the Shinkansen? So, what what is the what, what, why did that thing? Many of us think it's ugly, right? So, some think it's brilliant. I, you know, and so, so talk, talk a little bit about that station. In the in the book, you have some great pictures, and that's actually you know a super interesting portion of that that chapter. I I think that um, I mean that's that raises a really really interesting point about the station not matching the train itself. Uh, that was something that Kyoto leaders were really worried about because they thought 
Oh, if we have, so it's part of this idea of building the uh, international culture tourism city. And so they wanted it to be, you know, the, the ancient capital, you're going to get your, your culture here, but it's also got to be international, which means attracting an international crowd, but also being sort of at the level of global cities, being an international city. And that meant having infrastructure like the bullet train. And so they thought, okay, we're going to make it an international culture city uh, by bringing this high speed rail, the fastest train in the world to the city. But then people are going to get off the train and they're going to see this ugly, you know, not modern area. And there's like soot on all the buildings from the old steam train still. And, oh, there's the, the, the whole stationary area has to be modernized. Uh, and some already had been. Um, so there really was this pressure to modernize, to match the bullet train. Um, but at the same time, the, the, station uh the platform the bullet train platform that they were designing at the time uh planners very specifically said this should be both modern and traditional right so you have to have um they wanted uh, marble pillars imported from italy or something to get that international feel but at the same time the color scheme was supposed to be very wabi-sabi right really evoke uh japanese traditional aesthetics <laughs> so they they wanted to to combine them um i didn't spend enough time at the station to say whether they whether that's still a, uh, uh, an aesthetic there it really seems very modern <laughs> <laughs> so so here's a question that you actually I, I answer in the book uh, I think it's a super interesting question um Jeff wonders the why the Shinkansen is a standard gauge while the rest of the Japanese rail network is the three six gauge I yeah no why was the standard gauge chosen when it would preclude any sort of interchange with the existing Japanese train network I have a one word answer which is speed uh, but the longer answer is um, actually uh, there had been a movement for to have standard gauge railways almost as soon as the narrow gauge railways started being built. Uh, there were people in Japan saying, hey, wait a minute, we've done the wrong thing. We got it. We got to use standard gauge because these this narrow gauge it, it's really, really limited on how fast you can go and so it'll be better for us in the long run to have standard gauge and this started in the early 20th century. So just a few decades after the train started being built, there were already people saying, we did this wrong, let's start over. Uh, but of course that would be tremendously expensive uh, to start over. Uh, <clears throat> and so the um, bullet train presented an opportunity to, okay, at least one line, we can, we can do the standard gauge. Um, Part of that, uh, so part of it had to do with wanting to go fast uh, and you needed the standard gauge to, to really go as fast as they wanted, um, it was deemed. They came up with, they had, there were several plans for how to ease the uh, bottleneck on the Tokaido line. And um, some of them were to add more tracks for more narrow gauge tracks, but ultimately they decided the wide gauge was the more effective plan. Um, I think it also in part relates to the empire. Uh, the third fastest train in the world at that time was the Asia Express, which the South Manchuria Railway Company was running in Manchuria. And so the idea of having a better train in Manchuria than there was in Japan, I think was a little bit, um, mm, a little bit of a challenge for some people at JNR who, who wanted to make sure that the Japanese train, um, this is the, the group who were working on the original bullet train in the 1930s and 40s, uh, wanted to make sure that the Japanese train um, would be better than the, than the Manchurian one in every way. A lot of those plans became the basis for the post-war train, so that's uh, also part of it. So we have some questions on the politics. And since you were talking about Manchuria, 
Tanaka Kakue, uh, who didn't actually figure in the 1964 as much, but later, of course, was the one in the rebuilding the Japanese archipelago mm -hmm. in 1973 or so. It was published, I think. 72, right? so I think. Put it, put it to um, build a Shinkansen into the middle of nowhere. So on, on the project side, our, our dear colleague, Alice Kraus, my, my colleague here at UC San Diego, uh, is wondering whether uh, you can shed some light on uh, the politics behind building the original Shinkansen. So let's leave Tanaka out for a moment. Um, and, and unless he was involved, of course. Was it was this a bureaucracy-led thing? Was yes. Yeah. Uh, so was it an LDP um, thing. Um, was there interest? Yeah. Good. Uh, I'm sorry. I, we had a little bit of a delay. Um, uh, but I think I, I think I got your question. Um, the uh, wartime train was, as I said, it was an idea that had been batted uh, about quite a bit. Um, the the idea of having standard gauge, but then it was the war that really pushed it uh, beyond the the level of just an idea um, because there was just a need. To war and empire, I should say. Um, there was a need to get personnel and materiel to the front uh, very quickly. And so um, the existing capacity was not sufficient for that. So thinking very long term, um, JNR, well, it wasn't JNR at the time, but the, uh, the government railways um, did want to uh, did kind of put this plan into motion. Um, but another part of it was the idea of connections to the empire. So they wanted to be able to um, have population flow very smoothly and, and quickly uh, back and forth between Japan, Korea, Manchuria. Uh, and in fact, they had an idea of building an undersea tunnel between Japan and Korea. Which so, so I think Alice's happen. question was more about the uh, the Shinkansen actually. So, so then came so fast forward. So war is over. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, that that's okay. We had a little bit of a tech issue here. So the 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 question is about the politics behind building the original Shinkansen. Oh. Right. Okay. I was confused by your word original, <laughs> the original Danganronpa. They uh -huh. also called that the Shinkansen. Um, so uh, the um, politics behind it, you know, it really there. It wasn't mainly politics. It was an industrial problem. There, the Tokaido region was the uh, uh, most um, highest concentration of industry, the highest con concentration of residents, um, the highest concentration of use of JNR tracks. Uh, and so uh, there was just, they were outpacing, demand was outpacing capacity and they had to do something about it. And so it was really a JNR plan. Um, they thought about various possibilities, as I said, and decided that double, uh, that um, getting the standard rail uh, high speed from Tokyo to Osaka was going to at least relieve that, that um, uh, bottleneck there. Um, in terms, I mean, you get some politics then in it, in the specifics of the plan, where exactly is it going to go? And there, there's both examples like Kyoto, where there are local forces pulling for the train, but there's then there's also resistance. Uh, and so others have um, talked about some of the politics of it. Uh, Christopher Hood has a really good explanation of the what they call the political station of um, uh, Gifu. Um, wow, can't believe I forgot the, the name of the station in Gifu. Um, <laughs> I'm and, <laughs> uh, I've only written a book about it, but <laughs> um, anyway, uh, the point is that was, I'm sorry, Gifu Hashima, Hashima, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, I got it here. <laughs> yeah, um, there was some involvement of an important uh, Gifu resident uh, who kind of pushed for that that final option. Um, and there were some questions about uh, 
where specific stations would be uh, outside of Osaka or in the heart of Osaka. That's another one that's located outside of the what was the city center at the time. Um, so it's more in the specifics, uh, people either wanting the station in their space or really wanting to keep the tracks away from their space. Usually the opposition came from places that didn't actually have a station. So they were just going to have the damage of the train running through, but not have the benefit of people stopping there and being able to use the train. But there was also this thing, right, this industrial policy thing that you allude to in the later chapters of your book about the technocrats and the bureaucracy and this notion that Japan could build the fastest train, faster than American mm. trains and faster than German trains and faster than French trains, right? And so there was this whole push about, and, and the Tokyo Olympics yeah. timing, uh, we had a little bit with the 2020 Olympics, which of course, unfortunately didn't happen, but had the 2020 Olympics happened, I think you would have seen a lot of similarities like Toyota having the self-driving autonomous bus, yeah. right? Um, shuffling. Uh, athletes uh, and and tourists around and so forth. So so this this the Olympics as a as a as a showcasing moment. And my understanding is that the Shinkansen played a very important role for the technocrats in in showing the world that hey you know here we are and we have the fastest train. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but that's not a, that's not a matter of the politics of deciding to build it or deciding where to build it. It's really once it's being built, let's hurry up and finish it by the Olympics because people are going to be coming to see. So don't we want to show them the bullet train? So there was a lot of time pressure to finish it very quickly uh, for the Olympics and especially toward the end when things were cutting it close. Uh, as I said, it opened, I think, nine days before the opening ceremonies of the Olympics. So uh, they were really pushing it at the end there. Um, so there was a lot of pressure to um, to finish it for that purpose. And there was also a sense of, as you said, this is something that can, because it's faster than anything, certainly that the United States had, uh, and uh, anything that existed in Europe, it was this point of national pride to say like, hey, this is the best in the world. Japan is better than any other country at this. And so that was a point of pride. But in the context of in industrial countries starting to see Japan as a threat, especially in the electronics industry, already by the late 1950s, elect electronic companies were, as I'm sure you know, complaining about uh, these low-priced, high-quality Japanese imports. And so uh, in the field of heavy industry as well, there was the beginnings of some competition. Um, Japanese companies had won some big U.S. government uh, bids to, to build things related to um, turbines and rails. And so that also contributed to an increase in anti Japanese protectionist feeling. Um, so at the time, on the one hand, uh, in the 1960s, on the one hand, um, there was an effort by the Johnson administration, as well as some local governments, especially in, in, in the Northeast Corridor, to really look to Japan as an example and to say, what can we implement here in the United States? And um, the, uh, the the Johnson administration really pushed for and got past a um, mass transit law that would provide government support, federal support for mass tra transit projects. But there was enough protectionist sentiment that they were forced to add an amendment that said all purchasing for anything supported by this law is going to be 100% made in America, which was a much stiffer requirement than previous made in America uh, by American um, restrictions. Uh, so that caused a bit of a some tension in, in US Japan relations right away. Yeah, so I was I was actually in San Francisco this morning, and so just for the in preparation uh, for our conversation here, I looked up how much it, how long it would have taken me to take a train uh, from Palo Alto to where I am now, and it would have been 15 hours and 48 minutes. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's just we can't do it. So, um, uh, so if, if, if 
two questions in the, the, that I that I want to bring in. So the first is about Tanaka Kakue's uh, expansion of the original Tokaido idea. So we understand your book is about the Tokaido Shinkansen, but but of course you now a Shinkansen expert. So clearly this happened right. So there's more, and it goes to Kyushu, and it goes all the way up to uh, uh, Nagano Ken, where Tanaka uh, was was from, and. Um, and now, we, and, and at the time, that might have been okay, maybe, uh, because Japan was growing and the population was growing. But uh, we have several uh, people on uh, are here with us today who are wondering about depopulation in Japan and what will happen to this train, right? So, is it going to go sort of some sad way? I mean, currently they run every five minutes, and you know it will be probably fine if they run every twenty minutes. So it'll still be the fastest train in the world and the best run train in the world. But, but, but how do you? How, how how will this thing age, right? So given Japan's new and current problems, how, how will the Shinkansen hold up over time? Well, those really aren't totally new problems. They're just ongoing, right? I mean, even, even when uh, Tanaka was first trying to expand the, the bullet train system, one of his reasons was depopulation, rural depopulation. And he said, oh, we got to get bullet trains out to all the uh, rural areas so that people want to live there. If they can get, you know, get to, from one place to another fast, if they can get, this is part of the uh, informationization of the Japanese economy. Um, he said, if they can get information just as fast as people in Tokyo can get it, there'll be no reason for them to move to Tokyo. I don't think he was necessarily right about that, but <laughs> in retrospect, um, but that was that was one of the ideas that actually a bullet train having the bullet train go all over Japan, such that and his idea was you can get from one end of Japan to the other in a day's time. Um, you can do that now, uh, but it doesn't seem to have stopped rural depopulation, and and of course Japan still has that problem. Um, at the same time, they're still developing the system. Um, there are still new lines being built, new segments being added. Uh, the linear, the maglev, I, I'm really very interested to see if it, if it ever happens <laughs> as it's being held up by, by one prefecture, um, one prefectural governor. But uh, it doesn't seem necessary in, in this new circumstances so why are they pressing forward with it i can't help but think that the aesthetic function has something to do with it uh japan doesn't have the world's fastest train anymore and hasn't for some time they don't have um a lot of the kind of infrastructural superlatives have have moved over to china <laughs> you know tallest bridge longest uh, uh span of rail fastest train etc um so if they do manage to build the maglev that should again be the world's fastest train. So I feel like that would be very meaningful to grab that title back in a time when um, Japan is, is no longer vying for number one. Um, but do people really need to get from Kyoto to, from Tokyo to Kyoto or, or Nagoya or wherever it is in one hour? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Well, so, so that's great. Know. Actually, you just you just managed within this one answer, you managed to answer three questions that we had, which was that China has the fastest train, the maglev thing, will it ever go? So um our our um common colleague Amy um uh invites us to talk a little bit about the research aspects of all of this. And she's very uh interested in learning more about the kinds of archival sources you've consulted and where you found this stuff, right? So did anybody have a Shinkansen archive somewhere? Um, are there specific sources that were pivotal for your understanding of the aha moment or the also the infrastructure architecture thing? Or so so give us a little bit more context um about how you actually got went about writing this book i went about writing this book in a manner that i would not suggest to anybody which is that i really had no idea what i wanted to write i just was curious i just wanted to know about the bullet train so i went to the diet library and you know searched for shinkansen and you know how many million things you get when you do that and so i just started making copies of anything that kind of seemed like it wasn't very technical Right. I, I, so I set aside anything that I was going to need to get a degree in engineering to understand um, and 
just people talking about the bullet train uh, in any kind of way. So there were trade journals, popular journals, fiction, um, images, uh, visual images. I eventually did find a few films, uh, one television show. Um, the uh, That was kind of a neat thing, The um, that theater library at, at Waseda, the Enkaku, Enpaku, um, has all these scripts for television shows that I, I couldn't find the show, but I was able to read the full script with, with you know, all the stage directions and everything. Um, and so that was an amazing resource uh, because there was an entire television miniseries, 10 episodes called, I think it was called Danganesha. And it was just, and it came out in 1964 and it was just about various aspects of the bullet train. And, and that was a, that was a wonderful example of how um cultural producers were kind of bringing the bullet train into the story of Japan at that moment. Um, so uh, there's there's um, not any single archive. I just kept following my nose. Um, the uh, um, Showa Khan Library, uh, you know, not the museum itself, but they have this library that has all these uh, sort of Mm, daily life things. Uh, I did find uh, some videos, I think, and other things there, um, kind of some of the more ephemera. Um, one thing that I think one of the things that was really, really important, um, because a lot of things kind of came together for me when I was working on Kyoto, and that was I think it was the last chapter I wrote, even though it was the it ended up being the first chapter in the in the book. And um, I guess I, I mean, I guess it's too much to say things came together because I did have a lot of the book written already. But um, I went to Kyoto looking for some evidence of that local politics, um, <clears throat> and it was hard to find. Uh, and so I, I looked at, they have the, the records, sadly, handwritten records, uh, so that made me crazy, of uh, all of the municipal assembly, the city assembly records. And so that had a lot of, the, there was a JNR policy committee in that um, uh, assembly. And so I just kind of looked through for, for anything about Shinkansen or JNR and um, <clears throat> copied those pages and uh, spent a really painful summer reading through them and just trying to say like, okay, what were people talking about? And I ended up finding from that one glimpse of the evidence of protest, because of course, protesters didn't like publish their plans to have a protest in any way that, that gets left behind. Um, so I used that because they they would at least report, okay, we had 30 protests, we had 13 protests today, we had 12 protests. This is what they, this is basically what they said. So at least I knew kind of what the flow of protests and the general topics of what they were. Um, and uh, then by just trying to do, do, just doing all kinds of searches for the, for keywords, I ended up finding a, um, a fictionalized novel that I, gradually figured out as I was reading these Kyoto uh, city assembly records, I kept seeing this name Nishiguchi and I went, wait a minute. Oh, geez, is this the same guy who wrote the bullet train novel? It is. <laughs> I can't believe it. So I, that was a wonderful discovery of, oh, this person that, you know, I struggled to read his horrible novel. I'm not recommending it. Um, also, it was somebody who was actually involved in these, these trips to Tokyo to convince JNR to, um, to bring the bullet train here. Um, and then also there was a lawyer who wrote his memoirs and talked about the struggle as well. So in all these ways, I could find people kind of getting at this from different angles. So even though there were there wasn't like a kind of smoking gun kind of document, I was I was able to kind of catch glimpses here and there. 
Fantastic. It sounds like a real fun project because I mean, you, you set it up by saying, I, I don't recommend this, but I think actually the projects where you start out not knowing where you're going uh, often end up in very interesting places that then make it all worthwhile. So thank you very much. Time is up, unfortunately. This oh. happens faster than you might think. Um, so um, Jasmine Abel has written this fabulous book, which I recommend if you need a Christmas gift for somebody. It's both really, really well researched and a fascinating read and it has the architecture and the politics and the people. And so thank you very much, Jess, for joining us today. It was a, a fantastic show. And uh, everybody uh, uh, was... Uh, um, there with us today. Thank you for joining us. And I wish you a very happy holiday season. Uh, you'll hear from us. There'll be some letters and emails. And um, I hope you get into the new year really well and healthy and can join us again on January 9th when we look at the history of entrepreneurship in Japan. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Jess. Thank, thank you, you all. And uh, have a wonderful rest of the year.